Welcome to The Expanded Podcast with your host, Lacey Phillips. As a leading manifestation advisor with a process that's, well, radically different from the old New Age model, mine is rooted in psychology, neuroscience, and my energetic gifts. Therefore, I created this podcast to help you expand your subconscious limiting beliefs about the potential of deserving the manifestations you're calling in. In each episode, we'll walk through my expanders, a term in my manifestation formula signaling the people that already embody, have, or are successful in what we are looking to call in. These are the people that we witness through our mirror neurons on a subconscious level that expand us into knowing that our manifestations are possible as well. Especially when we hear about their background, their upbringing, their trials and tribulations, and any of their pitfalls that they had to experience along the way. Therefore, you're tuning into this podcast series to show your subconscious that anything you desire is possible. And by pressing play, you've already started the process of manifesting it. If you enjoy this episode, please leave us our review, comment, and share it with your fellow manifester that's struggling or could really benefit from the information that you're about to learn. Well, I don't know what you could possibly find today not expanding about our guest Sahara Rose and the conversation we have. She blew my mind. I was familiar with her work and her podcast, but not to the extent of once I met her in person. And in true projector form, after going through the process that so many of us have experienced, her body literally started shutting down from the diet and lifestyle she was leading. And it was when she found Ayurveda, she figured out her system that completely healed her body and gave her a system to thrive in. And so the way I'd like to describe her is it's very projector because here she is learning this ancient system that's been around forever and really boiling it down and condensing it down through a modern lens so each and every one of us very simply and easily can tap in and learn how we can eat, how we can live in order to thrive within the principles of Ayurveda. And you'll find this in her new book, Eat, Feel Fresh, forwarded by her biggest expander. And she shares the most magical story of how he came about into her life Deepak Chopra. Maybe some of you have heard of him. And now they're on texting basis. And I would say he he just expands her daily. We cover so much. You'll find this episode incredibly expansive if you come from a Middle Eastern background or a background where it wasn't accepted for you to follow your own authentic true path. You needed to conform to a certain path in order for you to be loved in. I think you'll find it very, very expansive if you've ever been curious about how to work in any oppressed community. She ended up traveling around and working in orphanages all over the world and many other organizations. I think you'll find it incredibly expansive if you're even subtly interested in spirituality because she's really well-versed in all things from human design to Ayurveda to soul levels. I mean, she covers all the bases and we see the world very, very similarly. On top of that, I think, yeah, just all around, there's not anything I can think of that one wouldn't find expansive in this. So kick back, tune in and get ready to expand. 
So welcome for joining us to the Expanded Podcast. We're here with Sahara Rose, who is an Ayurvedic practitioner. She's also an author. She has an incredible podcast, and she has a new book out, which I'm very excited about because it's very much the way that I look at life. Like, how can we take a lot of these Eastern teachings and different principles and actually put them through our modern lens? That's where it's like you can really pattern things down that are really constructive for people in the modern age. So Mm -hmm. I think this book is going to be very beneficial for everybody who is interested in that. So let's pop right in. Um, you're Persian. Yes. Ah, oh, you are. Hello, Shem Oh, Khuba, <laughs> Merci. Yeah. Yeah. Living uncle, in LA has just taught you Farsi. No, yeah. my uncle from Tehran raised me half the time. Oh my God. Yeah, so are you part Persian? Week. No. So he okay. married my Irish aunt. Oh my God. So my cousins are Irish and Persian. Because there's a lot, I have a lot of Persian cousins who look just like you. Persians can look like So anything. Shiva yeah. is a great example. Yeah, Shiva she's, she's half Persian. Half Persian, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. And half uh, Irish, I think, as well. Yeah. But it's so yeah. good. I love the Persian cultures. Like my, well, all yeah. Middle Eastern, all, all cultures, but Middle Eastern, I love. And yes. Tariq and mm-hmm. all the So things. good. So, yeah. yeah. Well, give us your, we know your cultural background, but give us where did you grow up? Was it a small town, big city, and just your whole upbringing and background? Yeah. So I grew up in a small kind of suburb outside of Boston. Mm-hmm. So growing up, my dad has three PhDs from MIT. Of course. God, and geez, he's, wow. Yeah. So he's like, was one of Iran's smart artist students and came to MIT on a full scholarship. And then the Iranian revolution happened and he couldn't go back, had to basically give up his whole life there and start from scratch. So I grew up really like my dad is for sure past life Japanese. Like (gasps) he's very, like he would send me to Japanese math school, literally. Wow. Did he meet your mom in Iran or here? In in the US. Yeah. So he's lived for like over 40 years in the US. And Mm -hmm. then my mom actually was a refugee during the Iranian revolution. So she walked through Turkey (gasps) and took buses into Bulgaria and then got asylum in um, Spain and then eventually in New York and just started teaching like Spanish and different things. And yeah, so like totally, and she's like a gypsy soul. (gasps) So the total opposite. So I grew up with this like mathematician science. His PhDs are in laser physics, nuclear engineering. He has his MBA and and he has in finance. What's his sign? Okay, so what's weird in Iran back then, they weren't oh, they recording. They didn't do birth times or birthdays. They didn't really have birthdays. So they're like, he's born around the new year, which That's is my like. my uncle too, yeah. which is April. Um, it's like March 21st, yeah, yeah, around yeah. March 21st. Solstice. So he's just said his birthday's March 10th. That's what I always grew up. And my mom's birthday is March 10th. So I actually always thought parents had the same birthdays. Like you find wow. someone with the same birthday as you and like you, yeah, yeah, you yeah. mate. <laughs> that like, was your association like, with like, what's astrology? your parents' birthday? I'm like, they're March 10th. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but what always made me not believe in astrology growing up was the fact that these were two polar opposite yeah. souls with the same birthday. How, how could this happen? Mm-hmm. Um, now I kind of am like trying to tell myself like he must have been born after the New Year's, he must be an Aries because he's like very fiery. He sounds very Aries, yeah. yeah. Um, but Vedic astrology is also very, very different, different too, and maybe it was the timings. Who knows? Um, what about you? What are you? I'm so in Western tropical astrology. I, my sun and my moon and my north node are in Capricorn, uh, and I have like nine planets in Capricorn. But also, growing up, I was like, I'm not really into all this business da, 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 stuff. So yeah. like, I don't feel like a Capricorn. So still, still, it was never part of my life. And rising was Sagittarius. Mm-hmm. But in Vedic astrology, um, it's very different. It's split up into doshas, mm-hmm. which are periods of time, and it goes over this 120 year period, and you're just born somewhere in that. And and in- the star is very important. Important, yes, right? and it's sort of a little bit more more of a macro way of looking at the cosmos than in tropical. So in that, I am uh, Sagittarius. Mm-hmm. You have like it's a it's a lunar chart. Mm -hmm. So uh, you just have one. And then my rising is a Scorpio, which is interesting because many spiritual teachers in Vedic astrology are Scorpio rising Mm -hmm. as well. And I have a lot of Jupiter influence, which is also the spirituality and in the specific house, interesting of food, health, nutrition, but then also of spirit, which is kind of like how I ended up here. Wow. Do you follow to um, astro cartography? I always have a problem saying that. No. Basically meaning like, and it's more Western tropical in the sense that like where 
lines are hitting. So where your Jupiter is hitting in Los Angeles is how you'll be performing within that ca- mm. you know, capability. Or I know you've traveled the world, which we'll get into as well. But it's a really fascinating. I get lost in all of it. Yeah. What I'm really fascinated about is planetary enneagrams. Do you Ooh, know about that? I've heard of it, but I haven't experienced it It's very it interesting. Yet. It's a kind of big part of the Vedic world, but it's the shape of your body and ha- how that has to do with the alignment of the stars before you were born, but actually when you were coming from the Akashic plane into your body. So the star patterns you came through, which is like, huh? Um, No, I'm with you on that one. I'm like, no, I've got to go check this out. Well, you can tell from the shape of your body. You're a lunar, for sure. Wow, and so what would that mean? So that's a very Vata body type. So lunar people tend to be more thin and lean and light. Like you look like you could be a ballerina or like Mm a black swan, like Mm -hmm. that type of person. Thank you. But if you think of, you're such a black swan. (laughs) But if you think of the moon, the moon is kind of like doing its own thing. It's orbiting mm. out. So it's a lot of artists, mm-hmm. a lot of people who, you know, maybe spiritual, but like on their own thing. And even with your spirituality work, it's super aesthetic. Yeah. They're very into the aesthetic. They dress cool. Like everything is, is artwork for them. But sometimes, and I don't know if this is for you, they can get dark. Oh, for so, sure. Yeah, um, I go through periods of that's yes. in fact it's so interesting with human design. I'm like, let's geek out on every Are you type a projector? Of projector. Me too. Yeah. yeah. You're, I knew you were a projector. Everyone's a projector. I'm like I've everyone met in one generator in my life. Is. Yeah. I mean, these guys are all like manifestor, two manifesting generators. Oh. But most of the people I know in are, wellness are per, the ones that like I I end up vibing with a lot are projectors. So interesting. Yeah, totally. Do you know what are you um do you have the freak genius? Freak genius. genius of freak, I think it's called Gene. Um, I'm not sure. I, I did this whole, they have this personal health system Ooh, in human design. They do. Oh my God. Isn't it so It was so truthful? accurate. Yes. Holy crap. Yes. yes. I mean, it was like, she was able to tell from that. She's like, you like to eat kind of the same foods every day. Are you the caveman and the oldest digestion system? I'm not. I was actually from when we were switching from gathering to farming. And yeah. I was one of the people who was testing the food uh, and being like, oh, this lettuce grow that. Oh, these almonds, grow that. So when I eat, I have to like my food. I should not eat something I don't like and yep. kind of make myself like it. And I should eat with my eyes closed. <gasps> That's really interesting. Yes. So apparently Jenna, um, Zoe is my human design reader and she's mm-hmm. fantastic. And she just let me know over the weekend that I have, um, basically I'm the feelings person, okay. which means I'm very sensitive to EMFs, die and all this mm-hmm. too, which we, we confirm that for mm-hmm. us, but also that I'm the caveman uh, okay. energy, which means I have the oldest digestion, I mm. guess, that there is. So it means I'm supposed to be essentially mono eating, like eating one thing I, at a I've time. met people who have, de- who have done that and it's really helped them. So helpful. Mm-hmm. And then also it's very important to protect my space and who I allow into my space and how I monitor my space mm-hmm. and how my sacred energy works. Well, you um, have a beautiful space here. Oh, thank you. You're doing a great job. <laughs> <laughs> so long story short, back to all the good things. Yes. So then you're a projector uh, by Western astrology. You're like a quadruple Capricorn. Capricorn. Yes. It was a Sag rising. And then a Sag. And I've always resonated more with the Sag, but as I'm stepping up more into what it really takes to birth out a brand and a yep. book and all of these things, then the Capricorn is coming out and I'm like, oh, I don't want to be run by this, but yeah. you you know, my next book that I just finished writing is about Ayurveda and entrepreneurship oh, and how these doshas really have to do with how you are as an entrepreneur. And, um, and that's really been channeling through my grandpa, my dad's dad was the first businessman ever in Iran. Wow. So like his, I did an auto- automatic writing and I started channeling his work Fantastic. and yeah. So it's like this whole like business side. And it's interesting because sometimes parts of yourself don't come out until later. Yeah. Um, but I do feel more than anything, like like an artist, like a poet, like that is what I lead from. Yeah. But I think what's allowed me to really make this my living is that I'm able to bring the business into it. Love it. Yeah. And that's all your cap on the Western supporting yes. it. Yeah. Um, okay, great. Well, tell me, what is... I love this question for everybody. I think it's the most democratic question on the planet. What's the lowest you've ever been or that time you spent on the floor crying, your deepest dive? Yeah, so this moment was really that changed everything. So after I graduated, I went to Boston University and I was already going back and forth to India a lot. I started spending a lot of time there when I was in college. I was teaching health and sanitation in the slums and eventually got really sick. And that's what made me find Ayurveda and started to learn about Ayurveda first to heal myself. And as I noticed, I was getting healed, not just in my body. I I didn't have my period for two years. All my bones were like cracking and breaking. Um, I would faint all the time. I lost tons of weight. I couldn't digest food. I was diagnosed with like IBS and hypothalamic amenorrhea. And like my body was just shutting down. And 
I tried everything. Mm-hmm. I went to every doctor you can imagine. Mm-hmm. Every I had like I couldn't sleep, so they said anxiety, insomnia, mental fit, but no one asked about each other. Mm-hmm. And at that time I was eating a raw vegan diet, which I believed was the healthiest diet mm-hmm. ever. Because mm-hmm. when I was a kid, I was really overweight. Mm-hmm. So I I read that. So I started bio. to shift, become healthier, 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 became a raw vegan. And then all of these issues were happening. So I wasn't sure what was going on. Same thing happened to me when I went raw vegan. Yeah. Every projector I know has tried raw vegan. Really? Uh-huh. Because yeah. we're just trying to get to the pinnacle of health. And also yeah. it's a feeling of vata, of leaving the body. Mm-hmm. And I remember I was an Ashtanga yogi. So I would just do my sore practice for three hours, eat that one meal, study my spiritual text, and go to sleep. Wow. Like that's all I, I was like, I don't even want to be here. I want to be an aesthetic. I want to move to the Himalayas. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that didn't really fly with my parents. Yeah, 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 so, yeah. <laughs> so I was started really getting into the yoga, really getting into the Ayurveda. And then I decided I'm going to write a book on Ayurveda. They're like, what? Like, what? get a job. Mm-hmm. And I was like, no, I, I need to do this. No one knows about this. And again, this was like six, seven years ago. It so really no one, no one yeah. knew here. And I just downloaded that I have to be the one who's going to modernize this and bring this to like people like me who aren't going to go to India and and learn all of this stuff. But I had never had a mentor. I had never had a guide. I had never had someone who I could like almost like replicate their steps. So it was really going into uncharted territory. And I don't have a book deal. I had never met an author in Mm -hmm. my life. I didn't even know what it took to write a book. Um, So the crying moment was... While I was in India, I was, I was dating an Indian guy for many years and found out he was cheating on me, found out he was like literally invented a job that he had that he didn't have. And then I had Jeez. I was in Bali writing this book and then my parents were just so mad at me because mm-hmm. they felt like I was escaping from life and they were scared for me, really. Mm-hmm. That's what it was. That's they, what it always they is. They felt like Fear. I was going to you know, not be able to support myself and sustain myself and... I remember being in India like one New Year's and I was like, I want to be more masculine. (laughs) It's like most people want to be more in their feminine. I'm like, I wish I could be more in my masculine and do something. But I was just, just, you know, going with with the flow. And I came back to Boston and after like Bali and all this stuff and then my ex was cheating on me and I had no friends and like everything was just like spiraling down and I had nowhere to turn and then really just kind of like verbal abuse especially from my dad of just like in Persian culture they don't give a shit like they will will tell you anything it's like you're a loser you're a failure you're a disgrace I wish you weren't my daughter which is like the worst things you could say to a kid Mm -hmm. but then they're cool with you this is just how like Persians like discipline their kids it's like you need to say the worst thing that would hurt them so they do what you want but that was my heart was like I was like chanting in Bali for four months I was like oh (laughs) And then I remember being the downstairs of my house, which used to be my playroom as a kid, which was just all of my toys and just hearing my dad and my mom fight about me of like, what's wrong with her? This is your fault because you were so loose with her because it was all of this. This is your fault. And them just arguing and like literally feeling like I was a failure, that they wanted nothing to do with me, but I also had nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. And I just remember literally collapsing on the floor of that play playroom that used to be my place of joy and just being like if there is a god if there is a universe if there's something like please just guide me please just show me the way just tell me what to do because I have no idea at this point and my parents really wanted me to become a real estate agent that was like (laughs) that was like their plan for me because they were like you can continue with this like chanting whatever you're doing but like sell houses on the side I was like if I'm supposed to be a realtor just let me know I'm willing to do it and it's interesting and Um, I got to that moment and in that convulsing and crying and them really saying, I want nothing to do with you, I became free. Ah, fantastic. And I became detached and I realized what was always holding me back was this need to please them as a kid. I had this good grade. Oh, I got into this school. I got into this, 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 this. Brilliant. So the moment that I was like, fuck it, you want nothing to do with me? I'm free and I don't need to. So I left to Costa Rica and then I went back to India and then I just continued on my own thing, but with such a different energy of like, oh my God, my mom texted me. What do I do? Da, 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 of just like, I'm out. Boundaries, free, yeah. ready to go. And, do your thing. And when someone sees that level of strength and certainty, I still didn't have a, a book career no. or anything, but the this fact that they faith. can feel yeah. that like, you know, it's like unfuck with a bull ability. I don't even know what the word is. It's just like, yes. yeah. And it got to the point, I'm like, listen, this is who I am. If you want me in your life, you're going to have to accept it. If not, Ugh, this is brilliant. You, you don't need to be in my life anymore. How soon did your book deal come after this? So that was about a year later that it took. I wrote the entire book 
without still having a book deal because I thought one day I'm going to meet this literary agent and I'm going to just show her this ready book. So I not only wrote the book, I wrote 2,000 pages of material, which I edited down into about 300 pages. I hired multiple editors, graphic designers. Like I was like, had a book that looked like this, I've still never published that book. Wow. But that was my learning process yeah. of like being able to not only know about Ayurveda, but like present it. And then eventually I met a literary agent through a friend and we were shopping publishers, the kind of for people who want a book, you you pitch it out to different editors. Mm-hmm. And they said, all of the fears I had in my head, you're too young, you yep. don't know about Ayurveda, no one cares about Ayurveda, yep. da, 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 da. all the things I had were just echoed back to yep. me. I said, this is going to be on Barnes and Nobles. I, I know it's going to yep. be there. And she gets a call from Penguin Random House, the world's largest publisher. And they're like, we're looking for an author for the official Idiot's Guide to Ayurveda, which is going to be, you know, in bookstores everywhere. Literally like the um, most published like yeah. Ayurveda book. Right. And we had an author and you have six months to write it. She was four months in. She realized how much work it is because it's a very, very specific type of writing. It's, it's a like, format. Yeah, it's like yeah. every page and a half, you're like, fun fact. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they were like, do you know anyone? And she was like, I just actually signed an Ayurveda author. If you want, I can connect you. They're like, I don't really know. She's really young. Um, so they said, you have a week to write the table of contents. What would you write? And this isn't like paragraph one to five. This yeah. is a 16 page table of contents down to the paragraph. And I just, that's when the spirit guides came yep. through all the work I was doing. I was prepared. So in one day I wrote the entire table of contents. I sent it back to them at the end of the day to show also I could do this. And really this was everything at this moment was preparing me for that. So they said, you have um, a week to write the first chapter. The next day channeled source that came through mm-hmm. and I was hired two days later. And that book is the best selling Ayurveda book ever best-selling idiot's guidebook ever. Oh my god. And gosh. yeah, has sold more than 50,000 copies, is published in multiple languages, and now those same published those same editors and publishers who didn't want anything to do with me are like up my ass trying to work with yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, and I'm but this book was like now I'm making my thing happen. Yeah, 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 it's your thing. I did my dissertation on Ayurveda. I yeah. showed you guys I know my shit. It was your thesis. But this is yeah, this is ready. now how I'm going to approach this. <laughs> so I just have to pause for a minute cuz I think this is so important for anybody who tunes in to the man manifestation techniques that I teach. But so you discovered you have your own true authentic path. You started to actually go down that road, even though it was defying of everything culturally you grew up with. And you knew that it was going against every grain of every college student. You went and explored it. And then you got all of the pushback and controversy of not being accepted for it, people not believing it. And then you went, you know what? F it all. I'm going to go into me. This is my path. This is my authenticity. And anything else that doesn't align with that, here's my boundaries. Get out of there. And then you went through and got even deeper. And bam, all of your stuff started coming through. Even though you you had to have a trust muscle, you had to have faith. You didn't uh, you didn't have anything to see to believe. You had to dig deeper and dig, that this is manifestation <laughs> right so i'm really really excited and so grateful that you shared that and i hope anybody who is tuning in who has any of these aspirations this is your ideal expander for that. <laughs> thank you for sharing of that of course yes. um what about what's and i think that we probably covered a little bit of it but what's the biggest childhood limiting belief you've had to work through in order to be successful yeah i actually never thought i'd have a job growing up Really? I thought I'd be a housewife. Yeah. I didn't want to have a job. I looked at my dad. He's always working, always stressed out, always paying bills. I'm like, I don't want this. Mm-hmm. Like, I want to like stay at home and then chill like my mom does, yeah. you know? I always, well, I grew up around my grandparents. So I always had the golden years. I was like, I want to be retired. Yeah. I was like, I just <laughs> want to like better. naturally just be retired. And then I went to India. I actually manifested being in a situation that I could have lived in India forever and be, be one of really the wealthiest people there. And, wow. and in that situation and feeling like a total trapped bird. Because one, I was in India, I literally couldn't leave this house without a bodyguard with an AK-47 because of their their wealth. And and just because of the danger that that comes with you when you have money in a place that is really in this situation. And I felt so unfree, so not in control of my own life. I didn't want to ask anyone for money. I didn't want to ask anyone for permission. I remember when I was a kid, my dad was took me and my brother to the ice cream store. 
And he was like, so what flavor do you guys want? I'm like, I want vanilla with sprinkles. My brother's like, I want chocolate. He's like, well, you guys have, to, well, you guys have to choose one. Yeah. <laughs> That's so accurate. Yeah. Well, I'm like, well, I want vanilla and he wants chocolate. He's like, well, you see, it's 60 cents less if you get a medium and you share it. I so why don't it. you do that one <laughs> instead? And I'm thinking to my brother, I'm like, well, do you want to just get vanilla? He's like, I hate vanilla. I'm like, well, I hate chocolate. And we're like, what do we do? He's like, well, I guess you don't get ice cream. I and, love your dad. But that just taught me. I was like, I don't want someone else to tell yeah. me if I can eat ice cream or not. So I was like caught in this duality, which I'm still caught in of doing and being. Mm-hmm. It's like, do I want to live this free flowing life where I create poetry and dance all day? Mm-hmm. Or do I want to be in control? And how do I have both? Yeah. How for you, because I've started to feel like I'm starting to really get close to understanding what that means, especially as a projector who needs the rest, who needs to like have the time free to channel. What, what does that look like to you? for you yeah so I got to this point about this May that I was really burning myself out I mean I was crushing it with my business like creating surpassing any goals I really had for myself and everything I was working for working for was happening and I was like super in my pitta the fire and then I just took this pause and I was like do I really want to be operating with this energy? Is this even worth the money? I want money to be free. And right now I actually feel more trapped and attached to my computer than ever before. So I went to Bali to write that book and I got engaged there, which actually kind of shifted the pendulum into the feminine, but an empowered feminine. And what I downloaded was that days need to be split in the doshas. Mm -hmm. So if you're per se writing a book or doing any creative process, that can't be scheduled in a two hour slot between meetings. Mm. That needs a full day to unfold because it it unravels and you don't really know. It's like the very beginning of your writing is not going to look like three hours into it. So you have your vata days, days that you are not in your pitta mind. Mm -hmm. You're just creating. Mm-hmm. Then you have your pitta days where you're doing your accounting, you're doing your management, you're you're having your meetings, all of that. You're coming forth with that energy and you're you're operating that way. And that could be two days a week also. And you should have at least one cough a day a week, which is just the rest, the nourishment, the recharge. And it's in that that the real ideas start always, to Always, for me at least. Always, always. always. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Oh, that's such... Yeah. And this is my favorite thing about projectors. We all have a, like our different systems yes. that we figure out yes. seeing, and you've got it. Mm-hmm. So, so let's pop into that really quick. Let's, and then I'm going to go way back into your story. I want to loop around, but let's start to talk about manifesting for the doshas mm-hmm. and also the potential of blocks for the different chakras. Yes. So people who are Vata, Vata is air energy. So they're very airy, they're light, they go with the flow, they're creative, eccentric, um, visionaries. If you look at Steve Jobs, he's a really good example of a Vata. He was able to see this world with these iPhones that do everything for us, but he was not the one who was really doing it. And as we know, he also had his massive shadow side too, which was he would get really caught up and in his head and frazzled. And he was a raw vegan also. And then named it Apple and then eventually wasn't listening to his body. It's a detachment from the body. So I'm very, like, like, yes, yeah, triple vata. (laughs) Right. So the vata is the air energy. So you're floating, you're moving. You're the kind of person that every idea comes your way. You're getting really, really excited about it. And then when it comes to the work, you're like, oh, I don't really know about that. (laughs) You float away to the next idea. So, is that right? So if you're a Vata, you need a team of these three. All oh, right, they're like way more talented than I am yeah. at anything. But what you need, and who can also be like, good idea, but <laughs> like- right because the Vata's the Vata's job really, you know, your Dharma is related to your dosha. Your Dharma is your divine purpose here. Mm-hmm. So if you're born with a lot of Vata energy, it is very a projector like like dosha. The word dosha means energy for you guys. Um, but you're supposed to create the ideas. Mm-hmm. But the place that they get stuck is it remains in the ethereal. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, it's really easy for me to start tripping about all these great great businesses I'm going to do, but it's the execution that's everything. Mm -hmm. So what vatas need to do is they need to move into the pitta, which aligns with the chakras. Mm -hmm. So if we look at vatas as crown, and this is third eye, what it needs to do to really manifest into earth is to move into throat and the heart space and solar plexus. You need to start vocalizing it, start Mm -hmm. feeling it, start embodying it. Mm -hmm. So for a vata person, if you're creative powerhouse, but it's really hard for you to get stuff done, just take 
action, not at everything. Focus on one thing. Mm -hmm. In my experience, if you really want to be good at something, focus on that one thing. That's it, yeah. Because everything else can come in due time, but for you to really crush it, like you can't be running 10 projects at once. Mm -hmm. And Vatas think they can do that, Mm -hmm. but it's because they're kind of a little disassociated with what's going on in this physical plane, in the physical plane which yeah. can be great. You know, sometimes like if I wrote this book and I knew how much work it would be, maybe I wouldn't have done it, <laughs> but, but I had to really, really work on to, okay, what can actually happen in this amount of time and with these resources? So it's really bringing it down to reality and taking action, moving into Pitta, which mm-hmm. is fire. Mm-hmm. So Pitta is fire. It is a fiery person determined, goal-oriented, execution. Mm-hmm. So if My fiance you, is like so pitta. Your fiance. Yeah. Men tend to be more pitta. Yeah. It is a very masculine quality. They do quality. run warm and stuff too, They run right? warm. They have digestive, like heartburn. Yeah. They don't yeah, gain like, weight. Yeah. They get muscular. Yeah, what is... Uh, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> it, it's, it's all their pitta. Um, so for, if you are naturally more pitta for you, you're just like, okay, throw me a task. I'm going to do it. You're just like a go person. You're yeah. like, Let, let's jump in, you know? That's great. You've probably achieved a lot because of this, but you hit a wall Mm -hmm. because you're doing, 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 and things are operating. And then you're like, oh, is this really even where I want to be going? Oh, wow. Yeah. And also why? Yeah. Like what's the big picture? Right. Because let's say you're in a business and the business is making money. Maybe you don't even want to be in that business anymore. Or maybe you learn that money doesn't even matter that much. Right. Exactly. But the pit does, it's so just like what's next, what's next, what's next, that they need to take that pause but they can't move straight into vata mm-hmm. because if they do this and they try to brainstorm they're just going to go back into doing mm-hmm. so what i have found they need to move into kapha mm-hmm. they need to move into rest nourishment reevaluation Love and that. that can't happen unless you take the sacred pause mm-hmm. so kapha is earth energy mm-hmm. it's grounded I Have you it. interviewed someone on your podcast that talks well, like this? Well, I dated a kapha for years, mm. but very kapha imbalance, I think, as well. Mm. Like, could not wake up after 12. Like, 12 had to I dated to one, eat. too. Yeah, t- very torn. Very lovely, mm. amazing soul. And so peaceful and calm. Yes. But also, you know, poor thingies with, like, a triple vata that's like, let's go, let's do, let's make this hell, let's go. Right. <laughs> well, because we are naturally attracted to people who have the qualities that we don't. Totally. Because that's how we become whole. So yeah, agreed. the Kafa likes to take things slow. They like to take their time. They don't want to, you know, they, the Vata is getting all excited. The Pitta's like, let's go. And the Kafa is like, okay, like I'm going to feel this one out, yeah. which can be really great. But sometimes it leaves you stuck where you are. And they say in the mud. It's more of a mud earthy energy. Yes, right? exactly. It is. It's earth, two thirds earth, one third water. Yeah. So it's grounded. If you think of Oprah. Oprah is very kapha. So they're very good at connecting with people. That is their strength. They're natural empaths. So Oprah, why do we know her? Because of the space that she's held for other people. And very new ideas that are very big and hard to handle when they're not appropriate. But since she's so grounded, she can be like, yeah, like maybe this world doesn't exist. (laughs) You in a car. And it's like, okay. (laughs) Whereas like the Vatas, like if you were Oprah, you'd be like, maybe she just quit everything. Like like end with a dark chance. So true. And all the picture is like it. Tony Robbins, like, whoa, yeah, yeah. Whoa, whoa. He's like motivation. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So <laughs> the kapha is this grounded. Deepak Chopra is very kapha. Mm. So it's like just super in their bodies, grandmother energy. Yeah. And they love to give. They actually find their power in giving to others. I think of the grandma or the mom on Thanksgiving, right? Yeah. She's like the week before going to five different grocery stores, preparing in the kitchen, all this stuff. And it comes to time to take pictures after dinner. And she's like, I don't want to be in the picture. I didn't take a shower. I don't look pretty. I didn't put makeup on. Yeah, Because all their energy is spent on giving. Mm-hmm. And they often end up feeling depleted because mm-hmm. of that. And they actually end up gaining weight in their hips and thighs because it's anchoring them to earth. Yeah. So cough is what they're good at in their jobs is like being a coach, especially one-on-one or Mm -hmm. a therapist or a customer service, human resources. They need to be connecting with individuals. Mm -hmm. Vatas are very good at ideas. Mm -hmm. Pitches are good at execution, Mm -hmm. making this team operate. So it takes all three to create a business or to manifest or to start a relationship or or anything. But with the cough is where they get stuck is... They feel resistant to change and they're very habitual creatures. Mm -hmm. They have the same friends their whole lives. They may live in the same place. They don't, what's the point? I'm good. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, how do you know you're good? Because you haven't tried anything else. Totally. So they need to start dreaming. Like I was telling I was at This Is 50 retreat a week ago, which was so awesome. But there's a lot of women in their mid-50s who are kafa. They've 
been the mothers and the caretakers their whole lives. So the whole retreat was just, what's your dream? Yeah. And just to think big for yourself because they've and never had possible. a chance. They've yeah. never had a chance to do that. So for them, they need to move into the Vata. So Vata's moved to Pitta's, Pitta's moved to Kapha, Kapha's moved to Vata's. I love it. And it, it really is that beautiful. And it is the chakras spectrum. too, because Kapha's earth and grounding and bringing it into the physical plane. I love it. Okay, yeah. let's hear about your theories on blocks and the chakras. Yes. So I think, you know, we can look at it from the doshas, but let's say someone is too grounded. So they're too much in the root chakra. So for them, they may say, the first thing they hear about an idea is that's not possible. Mm. That's not possible. They just, they, you know, those people, it's like, I have an idea. That's not possible. It's that's going to do, yeah, yeah. Can't happen. Right. Whatever. Because it's so just like, in, in the box mm-hmm. that they're not able to look for it. Also, maybe they're not even meant to. Mm-hmm. Maybe they're not even that Completely. person who's supposed to. Maybe you're supposed to give them the idea and the definitive plan and they're supposed to execute on mm-hmm. that, which the world needs too. Not everyone's going to be the person thinking of ideas. Sometimes we glamorize that. Mm-hmm. We need people who are just like, I want to just get my stable paycheck so I can leave at 5 p.m. and, and, like and live my life. And like holding the earth down, the holding planet the down. earth down. Yeah. Like, I'm like, I wish I could be more like totally, that. Totally, me too. <laughs> life would be way easier. Oh, my body would be healthier. <laughs> totally. So my, my nervous system. Because right. yeah. the coppers are like, you know, everyone's like, Rah, like going crazy and they're just like, you know, Hakuna Matata. Like, <laughs> they're taking, they're, you know, I just read the customer service email sometimes and I'm getting stressed out, let alone I'm not even the one answering. Yeah. But it's like the kafas are, they, they can hold that space. So root chakra, maybe you're not dreaming. Maybe you're Xing everything out. But also, it's okay mm-hmm. to take things slow. You don't have to. So sacral chakra, you're not allowing pleasure mm-hmm. in your life. So often we are so fixated on these goals that we've set for ourselves that are not actually in alignment with what we want. Mm -hmm. For example, making money. This is a goal I think almost everyone has. Why do we want to make money? For freedom. So I can be an artist, so I can have more pleasure in my life. And then you make that money and you never take the pleasure and you never take the freedom and you never play. Mm -hmm. Why? Because you don't think you deserve it. That's always what it comes down to. Yeah. Yeah. And it always comes down to like, well... I need to make this amount because then I'll be able to have this house. And why this house? Well, then people will look at me like this or I'll check this box, et cetera. But it's always, you know, this experience why we're here in these bodies is to have pleasure, totally. truly. Like why else would we be here, you know? Mm-hmm. But we and deprive to experience ourselves. All and the and to experience all that it is and to, to enjoy ourselves. But, you know, a lot of it is society. It's not even our fault. It's the way society is structured. And projected. That, yeah, the old paradigm says you yep. have to work so many hours to have this life. And now that we're rewriting that story, we're able to see there's passive income and all of these ways that you can Absolutely. create that. But you, I know people who are creating so much passive income, they're still not allowing themselves joy. And that's energetic. And it's energetic and it's also a sense of worth. I see that where it's afraid of losing everything. So got to keep going, got to work, which comes down to the same energetic worth of I don't deserve it. Absolutely. So I love that you touched on that yes. as well. So solar plexus, belief, I can't. Let's, let's say it's blocked. Or I'm not worth it. Yeah, I'm not worth it. Or who am I? I had a lot of that. Who am I? I'm not the. I'm not an old man Indian doctor who's you know been gifted the Ayurvedic crown. Who am I to write about this? Yeah. Um, and I was experiencing a lot of digestive issues, tons of solar plexus blocks. You know, especially constipation, bloating, which is literally blocks in my solar plexus. Because who am I? I'm Sahara Rose. I'm me. Yeah. So why not me? Yeah. You know, love it. Love why, it. If if not me, then who? Yeah. And if I have this belief, how am I supposed to empower? You know, some people jump the gun. I want to empower women. How are you empowering yourself? Yeah. And we feel guilt. Mm-hmm. I think this one's really related to guilt. We feel guilt if we are not if we step up into our power, then somehow that's going to bring someone else down. Totally. And it's it's not true. Again, it's the story that we've been told that we're rewriting. It's the paradigm, the old paradigm. Exactly. Yeah. So heart, if it's blocked, I mean, in terms of manifestation, I think it's, again, not experiencing joy not and not experiencing oneness because the heart chakra is more of a green energy. It's love for humanity more than romantic love. So mm-hmm competition. Yeah. If you're not seeing that oneness, you're seeing that person as if he's successful, I'm not. You are or different or yeah, whatever. getting attached to the story, attached to the human body, yep. attached to the race, color, gender, whatever your thing is. Agree and more. you're not seeing that we're all just one. And that story is exactly what is holding you back from manifesting. Could not agree more. And then the throat chakra, if you feel blocked, who am I to share the story? I'm not a good speaker. I'm, I have, you know, so many of my students, they're like, 
I, I don't have a cool story like yours. I'm like, I didn't like go out looking for a story. Like everyone has a story, totally. every single person, but it's just owning it. And the only way to learn how to tell your story is to just start sharing it. Like you don't need to go on a stage first thing. Tell your friend, tell someone else. We have multiple stories. I could tell you 5,000 stories in my life and we could have 5,000 different podcast episodes. Totally. So it's like, what story do you want to run with? Yeah. And what is related to what your message is at this time? Mm-hmm. So you just have to practice really that. Third eye, if that's blocked, oh, this is a big one, lacking intuition. Totally. I know people, they are kundalini practitioners and this and that, blah, 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 spiritual ladder. And they date someone who's like a con artist. I'm like, yeah. how did you not see that one coming? <laughs> like, you know? well, Projectors have the gift of seeing into people as well, which is such right. a such Yeah, a or they're like getting back together with the same guy who's broken my heart. It's like, real, like yeah. really? <laughs> like, so... <laughs> Our intuition is always, always, always communicating with us. And but everybody has intuition. Everyone Every has it. Person. It's not something that you have to go take a class or find. Or sit in the Himalayas for. Absolutely. A lot of those people in the Himalayas, by the way, are super not intuitive <laughs> too. Let's, let's just put that in the clear. Yeah. But it's trusting that. And I think what makes it hard is, is this my ego and my fear story or is this my intuition? Because always. when something's hard... Maybe I'm maybe I want to live an easy life and this isn't for me. Mm-hmm. Or maybe this is exactly what I need to go through. Which I believe creates magnetism. Right. And I think that comes to this is your word too. What creates more expansion? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, like this woman I know, she was, went to an ashram in India to mm-hmm. meditate. And she got there and she was like, oh my God, this is really intense. Like I can't be here. It's a lot. So um, after two days, she just wanted to leave. And then the it was a Vipassana, so it was silent. So the story in her head was like, what do you have to prove to anyone? You can leave. Like, no one's st- making you stuck here. Like, just go. Just go yeah. home. Just take a cab. You can just call a cab and you can leave. You can quit. Right. Yeah. But then the other story was, or intuition or whatever it was, was saying, how are you going to feel when you leave? You know, you're going to feel like you just let yourself down. Like, it may feel like a relief at first, but then later on, you're going to be like, well, what if I actually stayed the whole thing out? Mm -hmm. She stayed the whole thing out. She's gone back like 10 more times. Oh, I love this. I love it. So I think a lot of times we jump the gun and we think the fear voice is our intuition when it's not. Mm -hmm. Focus on what feels expanding. Mm -hmm. And then crown is channeling, which we are all doing. Every single person. It is the basis of everything I do. Every one of us has the capability to do it. Absolutely. And I think the word got almost a little polluted when we think of channeling we think of like i'm like channeling an alien or, right yeah, 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 yeah. right now i'm not on a script i don't know what i'm gonna say totally. in one word i'm just channeling this is actually not even my words coming forth Same. this is so- none of the manifestation else. stuff is mine yeah. it's a message that just comes it's through. choosing you because you have the capability for it and you've opened yourself up for it so it's saying bloop yep. you know it's amazing they see patents are filed at the exact same time in different states is that amazing how can that be yeah because this idea exists in this field, the Akashic field, and it goes down to a lot of people. And then it just depends who's going to move forward with mm-hmm, it. Mm-hmm. And some of us say, oh, I don't know, that's stupid. And then other of the, others of us start to embody it, envision it, act upon it. Lean in. Birth it. Yeah. But it's not your idea. No. It's just chosen you as a vessel. A thousand percent. Yeah. Could not agree more. And I love that. Yeah. Um, and those are all so constructive for anybody who's sitting in a place right now of like, what do I do next? And I know that I'm supposed to be doing something because I believe that every soul on the planet is here to do something. It doesn't mean successful in business or whatever, but we all have a purpose, whatever Absolutely. that karma or that purpose is. Okay. So the biggest shadow aspect you've had to integrate along the way. Of myself? Yeah. Mm. I think that, again, it's I'm like stuck in between this like drive, like going to succeed and going to do it. And then when I really question that why, it's like totally from the ego. Why? Because I don't know. I want to be like Deepak Chopra. Is that a reason to do why? So what I've come back, then what I come back to is like, oh, I just want to like chill and go to the beach and da, 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 da. So it's a duality that exists in all of us and need to succeed and be recognized. Mm -hmm. Um, My love language would definitely be words of affirmation. Mm -hmm. So it's like, to hear the feedback, oh, you did great, you did amazing, that was da, da, da. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you know, there's nothing wrong with that, but I have to be aware of it and not use that as my driving force to create things. And, you know, with leadership comes a lot of difficulties that people don't talk about because people project their own fears on you because you're the example of it. Totally. So whenever you're doing something they don't think they're capable of, something's wrong with you. Mm-hmm. So that's something you have to make a decision. If you want to be a leader, it's something that you have to deal with. I don't think it should derail you from that if that's part of your dharma. 
but it's something to be cognizant of. And again, it's like, for example, Oprah, she could have become the president, right? Totally. And she would have won. But I think she was smart. She's like, why would I put that on my plate? Mm-hmm. You know, you could have like Marie Forleo, for example. Mm-hmm. She was saying that she was offered a network television show. Mm-hmm. You would think that's every person's dream, but mm-hmm. she's like, that's actually not the lifestyle I want to live. Yeah. So I think focus more on what's that lifestyle. For me, my ultimate lifestyle is to not have to wear makeup every yeah. day, to be able to stay home as much as possible, mm-hmm. to have kind of minimal human interaction and do as much as I can online. To be real, that's what I want. Totally. I could say, I want to have a TV show and this is this, but that requires makeup, that requires seeing people, and that requires these things. So you have to be true. A lot of people love getting up in the morning and putting on makeup, and that's their thing. So focus on the lifestyle you want. And this is a reminder to me and something I still have to continually integrate. Yeah, that's something that I live like my whole life by too, is I'm always like, you know, there's been book deals, there's been all sorts of stuff, but I'm like, Am I ready to sit down and like slave after a book? I don't think I am. Like, I don't know. And not just the book, it's the promotion of the book and this. Everything. Yeah. And it's like, you don't realize it's really like birthing a baby. Totally. But. I still think it's worth it. But oh, you have yeah. to choose what's worth it for but you. But if it's for you, yeah. that it, and that's like the real message is like follow your authentic heart Ex- and path, exactly. not whatever you know, right. you've projected or has Because someone projected. would say, actually someone's posted when I said I was going to interview on my podcast, which we haven't done yet, in my High Self podcast group, someone's like, can you ask Lacey when she's going to have a book? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so like that's totally what maybe in 10 years no, I'm right. <laughs> it's like when someone has a kid and someone doesn't it's like wait take yeah, your yeah, time yeah. <laughs> yeah you don't need to have a book totally yeah. totally I mean at this point I'm right there with you So I'm quickly interrupting this episode to invite you if you're ready to start your manifestation journey or if anything you've heard in our manifestation episodes has piqued your interest to begin. We have a la carte workshops in everything from the basics bundle, which is what we recommend to everyone who starts. It's the formula that actually teaches you how to manifest, unblocked inner child and unblocked shadow. We also have a la carte workshops on love and money. But the real gem is the Pathway membership because it encompasses every single workshop we have. It's a year-long membership with full access to the few a la carte offerings we have and exclusive workshops not available anywhere else, such as the daily practice, which is what everybody in the Pathway uses, hopefully at least three times a week to daily in order to truly create the new neural pathways that one needs in order to manifest and houses the library of our deep imaginings, which is our unique hypnosis process that allows you to get into your subconscious and overwrite those old neural pathways, creating the new ones. You can use our special code EXPANDED, all caps, E-X-P-A-N-D-E-D, to receive $20 off your first a la carte workshop purchase or $20 off your first month of the pathway. Again, that's all caps, EXPANDED, E-X-P-A-N-D-E-D. Okay, now back to the episode. Okay, so what is the biggest shame you've ever experienced? The biggest shame I've ever experienced. You know, it's interesting because I was listening to a podcast with Brene Brown. Mm -hmm. And I never had read her books, but I was listening because I had heard about her and it was talking about shame and guilt. And I was like, really? One great thing maybe for my upbringing is I never experienced shame. Mm -hmm. I experienced guilt. Mm -hmm. I did something so stupid. I'm like, why did I do that? But it was never, I'm a stupid person. Right. I was always able to like disassociate the action to me. So I really haven't had shame. I mean, I guess when I was a kid, just like being a brown person and having a different name from everyone and being hairy and like totally. there was like shame around those things, but I've pretty much surpassed that at this point. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I feel like way more of my story is like guilt and like guilt tactics being used as like part of like, well, if you were a good daughter, you would do this and yeah. you would do that. And like just feeling like my heart being pulled. Um, but I feel freed from that too. Great. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. So you do feel like you've healed all of that. And yeah, I mean like guilt, for example, it. if I'm at the beach and I see plastic, I'm like, you need yeah. to do something right now. Like yeah. if you don't, like I will like walk by and then I'll like walk back to any stuff. So like I needed to pick that up. Yeah. So it's like more like 
you know, even the story of how I met Deepak Chopra, um, it's a long story. I don't know how much longer we have, but the key thing that happened was I was crossing the street in New York and there was this like homeless man who was asking me to help him cross the street. And I was so busy. I was like eating while walking. I was running late for a meeting. But in my head, it was like, if you think you're a good person, Mm -hmm. you would help this person cross the street. Mm -hmm. So I turn around and he's like, you know, really smelly looking. And I'm like, where do you want to go? He like grabs me by the arm. He's like, take me to the subway two blocks down. I'm like, okay. So I'm taking him, walking. Turns out he was an Iraqi refugee and he had two sons. One was a doctor, one was a lawyer. They lived in California. And Mm -hmm. I was like, wow. And he ended up being um, himself a doctor of physics. Mm -hmm. So I was amazed. I was like, wow, I was almost judged this person and didn't help him because of my own preconceived notions. But thank God I helped him. I had this great interaction with him. Mm -hmm. And I put him in the subway at this point. I've forgotten about the meeting and I checked my phone and it was Deepak Chopra wanting to meet with me who later wrote the foreword of my book. And I believe it was because that man was not a human, was an angel. And it was kind of a test of would you respect someone with the accolades and the prestige of Deepak Chopra as much as you would a homeless man who's actually taking you off your route and holding you back, would you give him that same respect, both doctor physics? Mm -hmm. You know, because like I look through an energetic lens, right? So when we stop seeing the difference between this to that, when it's just the same, that's when a lot of magic starts to happen for anybody, right? You know, because society creates all these projections of what's this and this and this. So I totally agree with that. And I think that's a good message for anybody who's listening and having those moments of, do I stop? Do I help another person? Do I look at, you know, this as much respect of this person to that person? Right. And everyone, everyone is your teacher. Everyone is your guide. And it could believe. just be in different forms and disguises. And it, and we just get, again, in the social media culture, we see someone with a great Instagram feed with tons of followers. And we think that person has the answers that person knows. Totally. And we don't look at the people around us who were really there for us to be there and of support who may not look or dress or sound like that part, but they could have been our best teachers ever. People always like, I want a mentor. Will you, will you mentor me? Will you mentor me? And it's like, did you ask the people around yeah, you? Yeah. There's a local Ayurvedic doctor where totally. you live. there's a this, there's a that. But again, we want it from that one person over there who feels untouchable, unreachable, whereas our greatest gurus are right around us. Totally. I couldn't agree more. And I, I believe we like incarnate with them many times. For sure. And yeah, I'm the oldest believer of no one's your friend, no one's your enemy, everyone's your teacher. Exactly. That's all it is. Exactly. Um, okay, great. And then going into where was the moment that you had this like beautiful moment where you I think we kind of all experience it a little bit in our career where you know we have had it the insecurities people weren't supporting us or we came up against you know the parents not approving or you know whatever our hardship was through it where you went okay I've arrived I'm here the and haters I'm are it. here I'm yeah, doing yeah. something <laughs> yeah. oh, or sure. just like I'm he- I, I, no, I've got this. Yeah. I'm worth this. I deserve it. I've worked really hard and, and this is it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you would think Ayurveda is not a very controversial topic. It's just a health system. But there are people out there who don't like me because they don't like how I'm modernizing it. Uh, and they're, they feel like they're the traditionalists who are holding on to the way that it was. So they don't like how I say you don't have to eat ghee. They don't like how I say you can have quinoa or avocados or look at your body or even that I talk about the doshas in this like common way. But those people, first of all, are not the ones who really know about Ayurveda. They're mm-hmm. the ones who like took a class of their yoga teacher training mm-hmm. and are like, this is Ayurveda and this is what it looks like, so I must follow it like this. So first of all, the people who are firmly aware of it, like Deepak Chopra and Dr. Suhas Kashir Sagar and all these people, they know that it's a living and breathing science mm-hmm. and that it will always change. And it looks different in North India and in South India mm-hmm. in 1920 and 2000. And it's always living and changing. I mean, that's what it is. It's a health system individualized. So yeah. how can we say that it only works for one one person? So you know, I would see these people, they would put up all these stories that I'm like trying to like change Ayurveda for my own benefit and da 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 da. And I'm like, um, no, I was literally so sick and mm-hmm. this is what saved my life and I'm going to teach what saved my life. But these people, really, it's that they don't want to see someone else succeed because maybe they saw that they had the same potential in themselves that I had. Oh, totally. And yeah. the fact that I'm doing it is just triggering that. Yeah. 
So that has happened, or I was on a podcast of this woman who's supposed to be this like Ayurvedic, like healer lady and did the episode with her. And she was so rude to me the whole time. Oh, really? Imagine like she invited me to be on her podcast and then was like so rude to me. Oh. And then like sent, sent me a message after like, yeah, I'm not sure if I'm going to air that. I was like, um, okay. But just again, just so triggered by me. Again, totally. I think when you're young and you're yeah. successful, people get very triggered and they feel like I'm older and I've served the time and who are you and mm-hmm. all of that stuff comes up. And again, it's no one's fault that younger people had access to the internet and were able to travel and live yeah. more freely. It's no one's fault. Um, so I think just seeing those other people's projections on me has showed me that I've arrived. I think that when you have a hater, it's a sign that you're doing something. If you've you've never, if you've never had that, then you're probably not, you know, there are trailblazers and there's traditionalists. Totally. And if you want to be a trailblazer, you're going to be ruffling someone's feathers. And I'd rather be on that side. Yeah. Same here. Boy, am I. (laughs) No, I totally agree with you. And I'm so glad that you have the groundedness and the wherewithal to to be able to filter through that and the grace to continue with this message. And I'm not saying in the moment I'm like, okay, it's all cool. Like in the moment I'm getting like triggered and angry and heated and I go through the own process of emotions. The emotional But eventually, yeah, it eventually just comes down to like, this is just what it is. What advice would I give a friend if they were in that situation? Totally. But when, when it's ourselves in that, all the personality and emotions and stuff get involved. But, you know, I, I look at Deepak Chopra, for example, and he has had so much hate and people who are just so cruel to him. I mean, all these people, everyone, if you're doing something, there will be people out there. You could just say peace and love. And there's going to be someone like, Oh, I just say peace and love. Totally. Totally. Um, So I just saw, you know, he's still doing his thing and he's like in his seventies and crushing it. And, I want to be like that. I don't want to be those people who sit home and stand out because I'm afraid of what one person said. Totally. Or 10 or 20 or whatever. Yeah. Whoever's afraid of the light. That exactly. You're I mean, look at like, he's not an example to be, but Donald Trump, like Donald Trump, the whole country hates him. Literally the whole country hates mm-hmm. him. Like no one's against him, but he's still seeing him. It's like, he's an amazing manifester. He's, he's an incredible manifester. Incredible manifester. Yeah. It's like he was able to see himself really as the president of this country without any of the credentials, anything. And he made it happen. Mm-hmm. And he obviously, has tons of shadows. He's very pit to imbalance, etc. But like I see it too. I'm like all the inner child, like all, wounding all the, and the, all all the, the stuff. stuff. Yeah. But it's like, why do us good people mm-hmm. have so much guilt and shame, which holds us back when all these people who are like straight up ruthless, yeah, 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 don't feel it. Totally. And they're actually destroyed humanity. Dude, and yeah, they <laughs> have like no. It's narcissism, but they have no qualms, right? But I feel like it's always the good people, and also tends to be more of the kafa people who second guess themselves in the moment someone says something. They're like, you know that person's right maybe yeah. I shouldn't maybe I shouldn't and no it's not it's not true people say things especially behind the shield of social media oh, that they would yeah. never say to you the echo chamber face to face, yeah 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 sure. and it's also just the old you know adage as the light gets lighter there's always going to be darkness that wants to take it out it's just so it's the same old thing everybody listening to this has experienced it at some point or another yes. and so bravo that you're continuing because this is obviously helping so many people exactly and on that note it, like break down the book for us a little bit and how the modern person can interact with it. Yes. Because it's not even like super traditionalist in a lot of ways. It really is any single person can access and use this. Mm -hmm. So I found with Ayurveda what confused me were one... What if I'm a cross between two doshas? What do I eat for? Or what if I'm a vata but it's summer? Or what That's if this? my thing. Or, yeah, and it's like all these questions I had that were like keeping me from actually just like following the guidelines of yeah. it. And then... Also, just seeing how different it was being taught. Like, you could read two Ayurveda books, they'll have different food suggestions. And Mm -hmm. I'm like, wait, this is all really, really confusing. So I kind of just spent years sifting through the information, looking at what works for today's day and age, according to modern science and what's happening today, and what are things that maybe need to, you know, be recycled and regenerated and refreshed. So for example, um, food is not supposed to be eaten if it's cooked more than three hours ago. Mm -hmm. Well, in in ancient Ayurvedic times, there were no refrigerators. Mm-hmm. So if I cook some curry and it's sitting in my 120 degree hut, mm-hmm. it's going to go bad. Yeah. <laughs> so that, you know, there's refrigerators, problem solved. Yeah. And also in India, there's a wife who stays home and cooks and cleans all day. Yeah. Do I don't have that. Do yeah. you have that wife? No, I, I don't know anyone that has that wife. No. The wife shouldn't even have to be doing totally. that. This is patriarchy. Yeah. There's a lot of patriarchy still in the Vedas. Totally, totally. So, 
So realizing that if you have a job, if you want to do things, if you want to like leave your house, you can't be cooking every meal from scratch, eating it while it's warm and then like discarding it. That's even wasteful. Totally. So that doesn't make sense. The whole uh, like leftovers thing has always been tricky for me. Plus I'm like, I could live on Irish mush. I'm like, me me (laughs) too. I would do this is like four days old. It's okay. Yeah. Sounds good. It's better. (laughs) You know what? I think it makes their immune system stronger. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> I, I I do it, and I think if you're properly storing your food, yeah. you know, a sweet potato can stay in that fridge, refrigerated in a closed container that's skin on for a good week, yeah. and it's okay. Like in a perfect world, I would pick my food from the tree oh, yeah. and eat it right now. The but, energy, yeah. But we don't live in that world. We have bigger fish to fry. We yeah. have we have dharmas to chase. Totally. And I don't want anyone to stay in their in the kitchen their whole lives. The whole point of this book is so you don't have to spend the rest of your life in the kitchen. I love it. And I made all the recipes. So they're really fast. They're really easy. Nothing takes more than 30 minutes. Minimal plates. I hate doing dishes. Mm -hmm. How can I make this one pot? How can I take out a step? I I use the instant pot all the time. Not sponsored by them. Just like them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's like the sautéed. You can sauté it, cook it in there, simmer it in there. Like you're good. Oh, I love it. And then also made everything tridoshic. So the breakfasts are one recipe, but you can choose toppings or whatever for your dosha. Mm -hmm. So you can make it for your dosha customized because most people tend to eat their own breakfast I found for example you can make sweet potato toast and everyone in your family can choose their own toppings something like that oatmeal everyone can can choose their own toppings lunches are six taste bowls so these are bowls that comprise of the six tastes of Ayurveda Mm -hmm. and these are six tastes that everyone needs Mm -hmm. to remain balanced Mm -hmm. and um, they're sweet sour salty bitter pungent and astringent which I break down so for example like a a Buddha bowl type Mm -hmm. thing where you have sweet potatoes and some salt and some lemon and some bitter vegetables and some garlic or turmeric that you cooked it in and some chickpeas. Mm-hmm. Those are all the six tastes. Mm-hmm. So really easy, but then how can I make it Argentinian? How can I make it Japanese? Oh, how cool. can I make it Filipino? How can I, you know, why should I only eat Indian? Because why does it make sense that you can only eat Indian food to be healthy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like there are blue zones around the world, totally. Costa Rica, Okinawa Islands, who are just as ancient, live just as long. They don't eat any of the same food. Also, and energetically, just having local ingredients near you, exactly. being able to access those. Exactly. And local is above everything. Why traditional Ayurveda is all Indian food is because that's what was local and yeah. seasonal and adapted to the climate. Why are there all these spices? Because they help kill parasites. Totally. Why is there no raw food? Because of the parasites yeah. in the soil. I was a raw vegan in India. I became super freaking sick. Yeah. Like, no, they used to call me the cow because they had never seen someone eat just like leafy raw greens. <laughs> they were like, Shiba? <laughs> Cute. Yeah. So I just look at it from that modern perspective and then dinners are all tridoshic. And Great. the way that you can make something tridoshic is to take out what aggravates a certain dosha. Oh, great. So if you're vata, don't make just like a kale salad. Yeah. Don't do yeah, it yeah, raw. Yeah, yeah. Or don't do like dry granola. Yeah. I don't know why you do that for dinner, but don't do something like that. If you are pitta, don't do a lot of garlic because mm-hmm. that's going to be really heating. Don't do chili and spices. Ginger, is that very You could heating? do ginger. Okay. Ginger is good for pittas, but you just don't want too much heat. Okay. So not no garlic at mm-hmm. all. If you're on a yogic path, which we can talk about as a whole other conversation, if, you, if your goal is to transcend the physical form and follow the yogic principles, mm-hmm. you don't eat onion and garlic. Yeah, okay. But the average householder is not on that path, and Ayurveda was created for the householder. Okay, A great. householder is someone who wants to just like live in society, maybe get married, have a job. Mm-hmm. A yogi, truly, is someone that actually wants to leave society and transcend this um, human experience. Yeah, to consciousness. And so love. you don't eat garlic because garlic triggers spasms in your esophagus. Mm-hmm. Mm. We find that sound scientifically. In the Vedas, it says it it creates a subtle vibration <gasps> that lowers your your prana. Wow. So what they are saying is completely accurate. Oh, totally. Or like, you know, when you eat something really oniony, you're like, oh, I need like chocolate or something because the taste is in your mouth for yeah. so long. So when you're meditating and you have that taste, it's actually taking you off track. Oh, totally. So that's why you don't have garlic and onions if you're in that path. But you can do a fennel bulb. You know, just cut a fennel bulb and saute it just like onions. And uh-huh. You can use that as a replacement. In Indian food, they use a spice called asafoetida, yeah, love which it. gives it very pungent flavor that can replace garlic. Great. Um, so basically, the whole point of this book, you know, I got into Ayurveda because of the nutrition and the health. And now for me, I want food to be the thing I don't have to think about. Perfect. I want to be able to just know what I'm supposed to eat, not be really freaking confused with all the contradicting advice out there. So much. And so I can eat a meal and move on and not stress about it and Google like, are these lectins good for me yeah, or yeah, bad yeah, for yeah. me? Like that's never the way 
food was consumed. Mm -hmm. We are using macronutrients to run marketing schemes. Completely. And, you know, let's say this doesn't work for people with arthritis. Doesn't mean it's not going to work for everyone. So I think that we are, we're way too specifying it. We're eating in such a way right now that's so detached from the way that we've ever eaten before. So how can we go back to those roots with cognition of what's happening today. And that's really what the book's about. Oh, good for you. I'm so proud of you for taking this modern lens that makes it so approachable and really does cut out. That's been, been, I practice so many Ayurvedic lifestyle principles. You know, I have yoga twice a day. I do Veda. I mean, I'm really into a lot of the Vedic lifestyle, but the food has always been a conundrum for me. Always. Because there's such a science and now you're really alleviating that pressure and stress and and perfectionism. So I can't wait. Everybody go buy this book and try it. Yeah, it's called Eat, Feel Fresh. Yes. Oh my gosh, it's amazing. We'll obviously have it linked. Tell us where we can find your podcast and what else you're up to right now. Yes. So my podcast is called Highest Self Podcast, which I'll be having you I on can't soon. Wait. I'm so excited. Um, my Poor Sahara, because I'm such a projector and I have endocrine issues, I'm always like, oh, I don't know. The traffic's going to be so late at that time. I know. I know it's I been know. twice. I feel so bad. No, no, so it's totally okay. I'm glad that we, we finally can, get to meet. Yeah. And it, whenever it's like the right time, we'll have the perfect conversation yeah. to have. Um, and you can discover your dosha. I have a quiz on my website. Yes. If you're like really confused, yes. it's my website is IamSaharaRose.com. It's like right on the top. You can take the quiz. Unlike any other quiz, I've separated the results between the mind and the body and Great. broken it down in percentages. So it'll tell you what percentage you are, Vata, Pitta, and Kapha in your body, what you are in your mind. And then it's going to email you a free mini course and teach you everything about Ayurveda. Wow. Yeah. And then um, I have, obviously, Idiot's Guide to Ayurveda is really good if you really want to like learn about the system, but it's also obviously idiot's guide it's for everyone yeah, yeah and this book is more recipes it's all shot in india really it's like a travel cookbook and wow. um i literally went to villages where they don't have electricity and was cooking on the floor with them so you'll be able to really see the roots of it but then also modernize it so my books i am sahara Rose on instagram as well and if you listen to this podcast DM me and let me know. I love hearing from you guys and where you guys come from so I can connect with you. And I'm so excited to be part of this Expander tribe. Oh, thank you for coming. And thank you for being so expansive and honest and vulnerable with so many people here. By the way, my word, when when people are like, what word do you want to feel? It's always expansive. Oh, really? Yes. Well, you are very much inhabiting that. I, I mean. just, just the, even in the body to feel yeah. expansive. It's Mine's like always because I'm best. so vata. I'm like in my aura. In <laughs> so your aura. Not even in the body. Yeah. I'm like my aura. Past, past like expansive. <laughs> just, do you know what the koshas are? What's that? Do you know what koshas are? No, what are koshas? Koshas are the layers outside your body. Ooh, so is it's that like the, the layers bodies? of your auras. Yeah. And uh, I, it's seven and then there's like three inside, but um, so ooh. you're, you're very koshic. It's so koshic. So <laughs> yeah. explain what those are because I know in Kundalini it's a really big thing. Yeah, so there is the physical form, the body that is made out of earth, Manamaya Kosha. And then there is the form outside, which is your pranayama kosha, which is your energetic body. Mm -hmm. And then outside of there, it basically just goes into layers of how you feel things. Mm. And I don't need to tell you all the Sanskrit words, but the point of it is that when you notice something coming towards you, you start to feel it in your anandamaya kosha, which is the most outside your bliss body. And then it starts to move closer, move closer, move closer. So really what karma is, one of the definitions of karma, there's 16 definitions, Mm -hmm. but one of the definitions definitions is bounded action from the universe. So it's when you are not on your path towards your dharma, you start to notice these blocks in your koshas. <gasps> it's exactly what I believe in. So it might start as the tap yeah. and then it turns into a knock yeah. and a punch and uh-huh. then an accident in the physical form, moving through the koshas, the, wow. these layers. I call them earthquakes. Right. But eventually it ends up earthquaking you under your exactly. authentic dharma or path. But the point of life is to live in kriya. Kriya is effortless flow. Uh, it's when you're on cruise control down a highway and there's no one in front of you and you're going towards that dharma. Love that. And you're meeting the right people at the right time and doors are just opening for you and you're not even doing anything at this point. You're just, just like, flowing. you're in for the ride. You're like, yes. okay, cool. Because you're moving towards your dharma. 
But karma happens when you go off track. Mine was, maybe I should be a real estate agent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, then it's like, and then the universe is like, no. I, every time I'd open the book, I would just start crying. Yeah. So it's just like, no, no, no. But let's say I'd continued that. I ignored mm-hmm. it. I said, this is just hard. Mm-hmm. I have to learn. Mm-hmm. And then I became a real estate agent. And then I didn't do any of this. And I'm mm-hmm. just out here selling you your house. Yeah. Well, eventually, probably something really traumatic would have happened to thousand me. thousand percent. To bring me back on this track. I believe it with all of my soul. Yes. Yeah, so yes. Life, you know, I remember when I first met Deepak and the whole thing was happening, like my life idol is like texting me, what the hell is going on? Mm -hmm. And he did a Facebook Live and he talked about me on the Facebook Live. He's like, oh, I met this young girl. He's your biggest expander. Right. So... I sent him an email. It was all about synchronicities. I'm like, oh, hey, Dr. Deepak Chopra. Like, um, you talk about how life is meant to be lived in flow. Do you think we can live in flow all the time or does it have to be balanced by inertia Mm -hmm. and stagnancy and like going inwards? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we're always taught, can't always be going Yeah, yeah. It needs to be balanced. He's like, Sahara, if life is not always in flow, Something is wrong. <gasps> I believe it. And I've now, lived in that so it's like many that is times the norm. in my life. Yes. That is the norm. We think that this is like a partially experienced thing only in certain periods of our time. If your life is not in a constant feeling of expansion and movement towards, you're not living in Kriya towards your Dharma, you're living in Karma. So Love assess, it. are you living in Kriya? Are you living in Karma? Got to ask yourself that, guys. Yes. <laughs> and all of us, we have yes. to ask ourselves. I love that. Thank you for sharing of that. Of course. Thank you for being here. Yay. Oh, bye, guys. Thank you so much for tuning into the episode and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did, we did. And in case you're not totally ready to join the pathway yet, I wanted to share a few of our free offerings that I'll often suggest to people as a little bit of a blueprint to get them started on their manifestation journey. The first place I like to direct people completely for free is the motivation. You can see it linked below or on our homepage as our testimony library. And it's categorized by different subjects, whether you're calling in career, money, love, wellness, and much more. When you're reading about a member's experience of what they manifested, you're actually seeing to believe and showing your subconscious that that very thing is possible for you. The second place I like to direct people is to the free clarity exercise, which is also linked below. In it, you get to try our own unique hypnosis process, learn about the science and some journaling prompts. And the best part about this You'll get a tiny taste of what it's like to go into your hypnotic state, bring your subconscious forward, and create new neural pathways while receiving clarity. And the third thing, if you haven't listened to it on this podcast yet, please go back to the episode titled Manifestation 101, where you'll learn the basics of neural manifestation to truly understand this process. So go ahead and check out those free resources, the motivation, the free clarity exercise, and the episode Manifestation 101, all linked below. And in an effort to make sure to have representation in this process series, go ahead and submit any process testimonials you have, especially to our LGBTQ plus community, our BIPOC, as well as the Ys, which is anyone in the community who is 45 and over. All right, we'll be back next week.